Welcome back, everybody. We're doing another super fun episode of Indie Reads Aloud. Once again, I am very pleased to welcome back J.M. Sandlin. He is my friend, so I get to call him Jamie. You can probably call him Jamie, too. I don't think he'd mind much. Welcome back. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. So we were just talking in the green room. This is like episode eight or nine that you've now done on the program. We we can't quite decide which. (laughs) It's either it's, eight right, or I, nine. <laughs> I think it's eight. I, I, really, I still have uh, a couple more books to do. So I know, and I, that's the exciting part about it. It's so mm-hmm. great to have you back. Um, so for those of you who haven't heard the seven or eight previous episodes, let me introduce you to Jamie. He is a fantasy author based in Canton, Michigan. He is passionate about creating vivid worlds and compelling characters that transport readers to new realms of imagination. Drawing inspiration from his love of storytelling, Jamie spends his free time playing board games, role-playing with friends, and indulging in other hobbies like, you know, martial arts and home repair, because you gotta beat up the termites. Just saying. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, When he's not writing, Jamie is often found lost in thought, dreaming up new and exciting stories to share with readers alongside his husband and their cats. So winter treated you well, I assume. You guys got through the the holiday time okay? Yeah, we made it through. There was, we had uh, uh, the toilet upstairs leaked into the kitchen. So that that sounds like an adventure. It was a mess between Thanksgiving and Easter, so it got us out of having to post a lot of holidays. So Oh, okay. So I don't know if that's a fair trade-off, but <laughs> right. okay. <laughs> hmm. So we're we're having you back to I love Grave Mistakes. I just think it's an awesome book. So Thank much you. fun with really, really creative characters and storylines. And the book you're reading from today is Cracking the World. This is the prequel to grave mistakes Mm -hmm. can you kind of give us an idea when we were talking in the green room green room you were saying it's several hundred years before can you give us a little bit of setup for this book yeah so this is uh just like a ten thousand word novella so it's uh about an hour hour and a half read uh my goal here was i wanted to give uh, by the end of grave mistakes i loved several of the characters so much i just wanted to do more with them but i didn't know what was going to happen next but I knew these characters had a, a backstory. So I wanted to tell that backstory. And one of the major um, ge- like geographical things within the world that Great Mistakes takes place in is the crack. So this is the story of how the crack came to be, um, how the world became cracked, how um, magic ripped it apart, and um, why and how that happened. So it's just what? a chance for me to what? go back and revisit the characters and um just show a little bit more of them of how they were 200 years before and maybe give us some new material to build spin-off novels right exactly yes yeah. so this this does not this ends with a conclusion of how the crack came to be but we don't see how the characters end up how how they transition from the end of this story into the beginning of great mistakes so that could be a future story of what happens in the time in between very cool. I'm super excited about this. You are one of my favorite authors. You're so much fun and your imagination is just fabulous. So I, I'm really, really excited. This is a brand new book for you, right? This just, this is an infant book. It just recently came out, right? Oh, actually, uh, Cracking the World, I launched at the same time as um, as Great Mistakes. So it is, it's like, it's a reader magnet for Great Mistakes. So actually, um, I give it away for free on my mailing list. Or oh, even better. So if people sign up yeah. for your mailing list, they can get oh, yeah. this? They get it for free. They get uh, the Invisible Castle and a number of other. That, so, that's another. So any reader life. out there who's interested in getting this book for free, maybe so that you can prepare to read Grave Mistakes, or mm-hmm. just so that maybe you can um, become more familiar with Jamie's writing, um, jump into the show notes, and his website will be there, and you can go and uh, get your hands on that reader magnet. So that's yeah. super fun. Absolutely free. We love free things. Free things are good. All right. Um, I'm going to give you the microphone and you can tell us this wonderful story for 15 minutes. I am super excited. When you are ready, please take the microphone and read aloud. 
so um, as I said, this is like, it's about a 10,000 word story. Um, I've broken it into nine sub scenes. So I don't really know how much I'm going to have a chance to get through. So I'm just going to set myself a timer and start with the top. So chapter one, approach. The knight shielded his eyes with a gloved hand and craned his neck to see the top of a dark tower that stretched to the sky, disappearing into the clouds. It stood in the center of a plain, uh, a plain uh, half a mile wide, ringed with verdant ancient forests. He looked back at the cart creaking behind him and the two gold-robed priests struggling to free it from a sinkhole. Lady Venica Marwall, resplendent in her fur-trimmed coats that dusted the ground, strode to the cart, waving the priests to stand aside. Spreading her palm toward the ground, tiny wisps of power flowed from the dirt to, into each fingertip. With a jerk, of, with a quick jerk of her fist, the cart popped free of the sinkhole. Tarpaulin covering the cart's burden shifted, and an arm slumped over the side. The bishop rushed to, to tuck it away before turning to the mage with a scowl. This is beyond reproach, Venica, he spat. I will not stand for you treating your duty with such disdain. And how dare you again use the goddess's gift without entreating her will? She flipped her hand at him dismissively. You contracted a mage, not one of your simpering sycophants, Aurelius. She made direct eye contact with each of the robed priests. You will call me Bishop Lightbringer or His Holiness. Oh, I thought we were close enough to drop the titles. Then you will call me Lady Marvel. The bishop's eyes narrowed. You are no lady, and you are no holy man. She brushed a speck of dirt from her nail. Without glancing at the bishop, she returned to the knights. Well said, my lady, he beamed. You know, I am an earl. I could make you a true lady. She smirked with a hand on his forehead, or on his forearm. Do not take us the wrong way, Sebastian, but you would make a terrible husband, he scoffed. And you would make a terrible wife. I thought I'd help you out, and look how you treat me. You wound me, Sebastian. Sebastian put a hand over his heart. I have no doubt you will recover. Can you feel it, Sebastian? Venica asked, tucking a stray lock of her dark hair caught by the light breeze. What exactly am I feeling, Venica? He watched the bishop yell at the other two, berating them for, to take better care of the cart and its contents. That had been the man's constant mantra since he left the capital almost two weeks ago. The magic, she said, letting the words glide from her lips. It's as though all of the world's magic flows from this tower, or from it. I suppose, she chuckled. It's a wonder no one has studied this. I think you know why that is. He nodded an eyebrow towards the bishop, yelling at his priests. Here they come at last. Bishop Aurelius Lightbringer pushed between them, trailed by the priest pulling his cart. Sebastian hiked the pack across his back and followed, again shielding his eyes to gaze at the tower's highest point. Chapter two. I told you they were short chapters. Chapter two, tavern. Well, open it, mage, Aurelius commanded. Sebastian stepped past him pulling out the glove and placing his palm against the smooth stone. He traced a finger along the faint relief of a tree carved in the cold surface. It was clearly a door by how a break in this tight stonework outlined a nine foot by 11 foot rectangle, but there was no handle or knocker. Should I just pound on it? Then I could trace the thin fingers along the scene. My research into the world tower, <clears throat> the world tower elder cell was far from complete. Any who claim to have entered recent re uh, recounted wildly discordant tales of what lies within. Some described combats against dread beasts they barely survived. Others told of riddles plucked from the deepest, deepest recesses of their minds. I do not believe any to be true. I believe no one has entered and survived. Well, lucky for us, said Sebastian, we have you. The one theme present in all accounts was a praise to El Elisara, crediting her alone for the survival. Uh, you know better. I know otherwise. Venica felt the magic sigh through the hairline crack surrounding the door. She twisted the filament of it around her pointer finger, imbuing it with her own will. Open, she told it, passing the thread back through the crack. With a snap, the tree relief split cleanly in half. Dust shook free of the gap as the stone door swung outward. I hope you never get bored of me praising you, but good work, said Sebastian. He stepped over the threshold into the tower. Inside, it looked like the back room of a tavern somewhere deep in the slums. Dusty, drink-stained tables were spread across a floor littered with spilled food, broken chairs, and unknown debris. It was as though a drunken brawl had happened the night before, and no one had been in yet to tidy up. A few broken barrels and casks cluttered a corner beside a wooden staircase to his right that wound anti-clockwise to the plank wood ceiling about 15 feet up. Huh, 
he mused, sniffing at the air, reeking of stale ale and sweat. Thetica stepped beside him. This is nothing like I expected. This is the grand center of magic, Aurelius said, between, between telling the priest to take care of pulling the cart over the threshold. Are we to perform a sacred ritual in a horror's den? You should visit more horror's dens, my good sir, says Sebastian. That is, uh, that this is nice compared to some that I've heard about. Second or third hand, naturally, I've surely not been in personally. Why is it a brave name needed for this? asked the bishop. Lower Sebastian goes where I go, said Thetica. She glided to the ta <clears throat> tavern center, hands waving to pick motes of magic from the air. Power flows into this tower, like rivers to the ocean. I can sense them culminating at a park at a point far above us, perhaps at the pinnacle of Elderstone. Sebastian walked to the end of the stairs, staring up to where they disappeared into the, top, uh, the dark uh, one level up. He stamped on the first one, testing its construction. Odd, he mumbled. What is it? Venica moved beside him, following his gaze up the stairs. The stairs, they're going the wrong way. He pulled the long sword sheathed at his hip and ascended two stairs. Towers are built to prefer right-handed defenders coming down, which puts the outer wall on your right as you descend. That assumes the central supports of stairs. These stairs are open, so the wall must be to, to the left coming down. He swung his sword in an expert arc, flashing through the open air, slicing and piercing an invisible defender, defender above him. I'm perfectly ambidextrous, of course, so none of this affects me, but it's not something an architect would miss. Get to the point, knight, Aurelius groaned. Hmm, uh, either whoever built this place doesn't care about defensibility, or doesn't know about it, or it's not meant to defend from above. He went up two steps, turned, and swung a dramatically clumsy sword strike with, with the outer wall interfering with the swarm. You use a lot <clears throat> you use a lot of words to say nothing, said the bishop. Venica, can you perform the ritual here? She glanced at the carts in the form shrouded by canvas. More magic than I have ever felt flows to this point, but I cannot properly guess at what is needed until I begin. By then, it may be too late to relocate, should, I, should the knees arise. We go up then, but I can sheath, or, I'm sorry, Sebastian sheathed his sword as he came down the steps. He stomped twice on the floorboards at the bottom of the stairs, listening to the dull thud. I'm just making sure we can't go down. What about him? He jerked his chin toward the carts. The boy must come with us, said Velka, obviously. I see no ramp access, so I guess you gents are carrying him. Sebastian jangled his sword in the scabbard, grinning at the priests. With a barely audible groan, one moved to gather the feet of the body on the canvas, nodding to the other to take the other end. Bishop Lightbringer rushed them, flailing his arms, so they dropped the body back into the cart. Stop this madness, Lord Sebastian, you are the strongest of body here. Is that not why Lady Marwell dragged you along? Well, it certainly wasn't for my looks, he flashed a roguish grin, rubbing a hand across his impeccably cut beard. Precisely. What's these men lack in muscle? They make up for more in their faith. Still, the rituals we're about to perform are not for their eyes. You may carry my son yourself. You honor me, Sebastian gasped, <clears throat> clapping a hand to his chest. Though I doubt even I possess the stamina to transport dead weight up the thousand stories of this tower. The bishop clenched his fists. My son is not dead weight. He's dead and he has weight, Sebastian shrugged. With luck, he'll walk out of here himself. Bishop Lightbringer grunted through a tight jaw, turning to the priests. You are dismissed. I needed to remind you of strict repercussions should you spread word of what you have heard or witnessed here. You needed, but you just did, Sebastian chuckled. The two priests bowed, kissed the bishop's ring, and left without another glance back. Sebastian watched them pick their way <clears throat> around the uneven ground surrounding the tower until he lost interest. Come, Sebastian, Venica said from the stairs. I hunger to work with such magic as it floods this place. As it pleases you, he bowed and crossed to the carts. Rolling the, rolling the body over, he slipped an arm under the waist, hefted it onto the shoulder. Be careful, Bishop Lightbringer growled. If anything happens to my boy, I'll do everything in my power to destroy your life. Coming from the man who's or coming from the man whose son died of a curable illness, I'm not entirely concerned. The bishop straightened his tall hat and followed Venica up the steps. Sebastian gave one last glance over the scene of a ruined tavern before passing through the door, dividing the next level of the tower. Chapter three, question. Ooh, do I have time? I, might, I think I have time. Question. 20 feet ahead stood a soldier in pure white plate armor, hand resting on the sword pummel at his hip and face obscured with a featureless visor helm. What is this now? Bishop Lightbringer asked. Sebastian heard the door click close behind him, but turned slowly, saw only solid stone. 
The wall faded into the room's darkness. The only other light shone like a spotlight over the armored figure. Three come, and another split in two, said the soldier. Why? Fenneca stepped forward, holding a crystal shard, glowing a faint blue. I require the power of Eldrassil to perform a task. The power of Eldrassil is the power of the world. It is not for a single one to use. I do not wish to keep the power, only that I, only my task requires that I be at this nexus. Let us pass. Yes, by Elisara's name, let us pass, said Lightbringer. I do not move for the word or for the word of a lesser, said the soldier. Prove your conviction. How would we do that? asked Fenneca. A lesser? Lightbringer balls hands to fists. What would you give up to continue? asked the soldier. <clears throat> I would give up anything to have my son back, said the bishop. That is broad. Would you give up your life? Give up your faith in the goddess? The soldier tilted their head. Lightbringer shy back and said, How would I how would I know Malthus lives if I died bringing him back? How can I how can that happen? With, uh, how can it happen without Elsar's grace? Noted, said the soldier, turning their visor helm to Lady Marwall. What would you give up? If I succeed, I would prove myself more powerful than death, more powerful than Lady Elphabe. I would give up all life outside this tower to bask in the power and knowledge I would glean from my time here. The soldier turned. A nodding towards Sebastian. Oh, my turn? Oh, I wouldn't give up anything. I don't care if the boy lives or stays dead. Fascinating. No, that's not true at all. I do want this to succeed, for Venica to succeed. I'd give up anything short of my life for her, only because I know she'd be miserable without me. A father who would give nothing, a mage who would give all, and a knight who would give all but his life. I'm an earl, said Sebastian. That sounds more impressive. <clears throat> See here. I would give anything for my son, Bishop Lightbringer jumped forward. I am a humble man of integrity and honor. The soldier ignored the bishop's powers. And what of him? They waved a hand at the body over Sebastian's soldier, then the crystal of Venica's hand. What would he give up to proceed? Sebastian hefted the body and adjusted the breast shoulder. What do you say, boy? My son has been through enough without you seeking boons of him, said the bishop. The soldier raised their gauntleted hand again, beckoning one finger of the crystal in Lady Marwell's, Lady Marwell's hand. The soft blue glow pulsed once and flashed, causing the three to shield their eyes. When he blinked away the burning afterimage, Sebastian saw the boy standing before Venica, glowing a soft blue, the large, deep eyes, mess of dark hair, and vestments were the same as the boy across the shoulder, if not slightly translucent. What's going on? The boy asked drowsily. Malthus! The bishop rushed his son, but passed through him as he attempted to embrace him. What devilry is this? You're, <clears throat> you are dead, young man, the soldier said calmly. We are discussing what's what your companions would give up for the chance to bring you back. Bring me back? The fever took me? He touched the amulet hanging from a chain around his neck. Then this is Elisar's will. Otherwise, she would have saved me. Lady Marwall tucked the crystal into his sleeve. No, Bishop Lightbringer brought his hands close to his son's shoulders. His cheeks shone with wet, shone wet with tears of the ghosts, or in the ghosts' soft blue light. This was a mistake. You should not have died. I shouldn't have? Malthus backed away from his father, looking up at Lady Marwall and Lord Sebastian as seeing them for the first time. His eyes lingered on the canvas-wrapped body slumped over the knight's shoulder, and the hand hanging loose from it. Sebastian shifted, turning the, boy from the, turning the body from the boy's gaze. I don't want to be dead, said Malthus. But I don't want to subvert Elisara or Lady Alpha as well. That is not an answer, but I will accept it, said the soldier. Will you say the same when the moment of free light is upon us? We shall see. The soldier stepped to the side and, with one fluid motion, drew their swords, sliced a clean horizontal arc through the sky, through the air, and replaced it in its scabbard. A line of white energy hung in the air, slowly expanding vertically, its brightness intensified glowing to fill this vision until Sebastian had to shield his eyes from intensity. When he blinked it away, they stood on a wide stone balcony. The tower pierced the sky, <clears throat> or the tower piercing, pierced the sky while the lungs stretched in all directions a hundred feet below. Lady Marwell slapped her hands on the polished stone railing, looked over the edge with huff. They have the directions, descriptions of this place were based in reality. She turned to the slender uh, stained glass doors leading back into the tower. This place vexes us with the inanity and magic too quick to counter. Crossing the balcony in three long strides, she yanked the door open to disappear in the darkness. The ghost youth followed her, 
with his body with his father close behind. Sebastian glanced across the plains, shifting the body on his shoulder on his shoulder and followed the others. Well done. Thank you yeah. very, very much. That's super fun. Yeah. So each of the characters will get tested as they go through the tower. And then there's a little bit of mirroring and what happens between this and in Great Mistakes. So this was a lot of fun to write. It kind of fell out of me, which is always kind of fun. That is fun when that happens, when the, the muse yeah. just takes over and says, you will write this. You just kind of step aside and let it do its thing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, so writing a prequel requires some extra little pieces. What did you find was the most challenging part about writing a story before the story? So I I have, I've done a prequel before with um, uh, with Necromancer of Urbis. That was a mm -hmm. prequel-ish to my trilogy. And reading it back later, I realized that it required too much information from the trilogy. You couldn't really read it first. So one of the things that I really needed to make sure of this was that it would be a standalone thing. And um, whatever pieces that are references to, to the later story or the other thing I already wrote um, were just more, more like Easter eggs. And they weren't things that you had to know. You didn't have to know all the references. So um, like when the, the, the boy's name is, when you're told it's Malthus, um, now when you're reading uh, Great Mistakes later, you will know who Malthus is before it's revealed in the book. So you're getting a little bit of a spoiler for Great Mistakes, but it's okay. But it all kind of ties together and it, and it works. So yes. what was the, the, the least complex part, the easiest part of writing a prequel? Um, getting back into the characters, for sure. Um, Laura, Seb uh, yeah, Laura Sebastian is one of my favorite characters to write. Um, I think I said when, when we're talking about Great Mistakes, there's a, a couple chapters of Great Mistakes where he goes away, and yeah. then when he comes back, it was like, just, oh, yay, joy. Yay, he's back. <laughs> like, oh, thank you. I have missed you. So, Yeah, I, isn't I that crazy how that works? We, right, we like, get so it, attached to our characters, and, and we really do start engaging with them as though they were real and yeah. we miss them when they're gone <laughs> we 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 technically can control when they come and go but but not really but no, not right. really <laughs> <laughs> so i think just getting into um getting into lord sebastian a lot of his quirkiness but then also seeing um lady marwall having like turning her more into a human she's very very dispassionate um or at least She's lost a lot of her humanity from great mistakes. Mm -hmm. So seeing how she is in the past was, was a lot of fun and just learning her character more. Just giving her history. Yes, right? exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very cool. I'm so glad that you came back to read for us again. And I know you have more books to read, so you'll be back on the program in the future. Yeah, I'll be back. Can't get rid of me. <laughs> well, I, I rejoice at that fact, truly, because I, I just think you're a wonderful storyteller, and I, I'm really pleased that you keep coming back to share your work with us. I look forward to the next time you're on the show. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. You're welcome.